And today what I want to talk about is a guy by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas was an encourager. We read a little bit about his life this last week, but I want to talk about how to be an encourager. You know, people can be a blessing or people can be a burden. You know that, right? There are people that are in our lives that are blessings to us, but there can also be people sometimes in our lives that are a burden to us. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Solomon wrote this book of Ecclesiastes. I love all the wisdom that we find in this book. But Ecclesiastes chapter 4, this is what he says about partnership. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. We all need somebody to lift us up. And we need to do the lifting sometimes for other people's lives. Uh, I was reading a story about John Wooden. John Wooden coached the UCLA Bruins. And he built his team on the principles of team over me. Team over me. There's no I in team, right? And he was called the Wizard of Westwood. He won 10 national championships in a 12-year span in, in NCAA basketball. He won seven championships in a row, seven years in a row. And Wooden told his uh, players that, that whenever they made a basket, the player who made the basket was required to turn around and either smile or wink or point or nod to the person who passed him the ball. And one year, uh, Coach Wooden was given these instructions to the team that they came in. One of the new players said, but coach, what if he's not looking? And the coach said, I guarantee you he'll be looking. <laughs> because people want encouragement. People want to be uh, noted. They want to be uh, strengthened. And so, you know, Wooden was right with this. Everyone's looking for encouragement. Everybody's looking for affirmation. You know, uh, one of the big sad parts of human nature is that people... Have you noticed this? People are so quick to tear down, so quick to criticize, so quick to tear down rather than to build up. I, I, I probably could say for every word of encouragement we hear, we probably hear two or three words of discouragement. And the church, the church is a family, and we should be a place of love, and we should be a place of encouragement. God wants us to be different. He totally wants us to be different than other people out there that don't know him. He wants us to be a loving presence in this world. He wants us to be a breath of fresh air to the people that are around us. He told us to love our enemies. How revolutionary is that? Love your enemies. Do good to those that mistreat you. Bless those who curse you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, the early church is told, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. In Romans chapter 15, it says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So the Lord wants us, his, his children, to be the kind of people that people love to be around. They know that when they're around us who follow Jesus, they're gonna hear words of blessing, they're gonna be encouraged, they're gonna be prayed for, that's the way he wants us to be. So when we look at the scriptures, uh, we see how to be an encourager practically from the life of Barnabas. And that's who I want to look at today. So I want to, I, want to, I want to encourage you to be an encourager. That's my goal today. So how can you become an encourager? Here's the very first thing. Take time to bless others. Look at the story in Acts chapter 4, talking about Joseph. Thus Joseph who was also called by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if I told you at the very beginning I was going to tell you a story about a man named Joseph, you probably would not have identified who it was. You might have said, Joseph, you know, is that Jesus' is son? But this man's name was Joseph, but the early church gave him a nickname. How many of you have nicknames? I think I've got several nicknames. Um, when I was, when, you know, some people you just call them by their last name, right? Some people you call them by their first name. Some people you got to use both their names, right? Like in our family, we have John Brown. It's never John. It's never Brown. You got to say John Brown, right? When I was growing up, for whatever reason, 
my name, Cowan. That's what, nobody called me Tim, they called me Cowan. In fact, when I was in grade school, they would call me Cow Moo In. And I'd get in fights and get, you know, in trouble. But uh, Barnabas had a nickname. And it literally meant son of encouragement. The Greek meaning of Barnabas is a son of encouragement. Look at this. For thousands of years, this guy is honored and remembered because he was an encourager. The church knew him to be a great blessing and a great encouragement. And so one of the things that Barnabas did here is he put his money where his mouth was. And in this first church, we know that they had many, many poor people that came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there would be many people that might lose their jobs, lose their families when they became a follower of Jesus. They would be disowned. They would be rejected. And here's Barnabas selling land, taking the money, giving it to the apostles, and having them distribute it to other people that needed a leg up, that needed help. That's what he was doing. He was being an encourager. Here's the principle that I want you to see. An encourager sees a need and meets it. Now, a lot of people see a need, right? <laughs> uh, there are people frequently that will come to me and say, Pastor, I, I see this need. I, I see this problem. I see this issue. We all see needs, but an encourager is somebody who sees a need and meets it. Sometimes it's money. In this case, this was Barnabas, giving money to meet a need. You know, one of the things that I'm so proud of for our church family is the way we meet needs, the way we help people. Uh, we don't always advertise it. We don't always talk about it, but we've got a benevolence fund. Um, it's got uh, money that you contribute to it, and there are certain people in our church that particularly contribute to it, and we have helped people meet their needs. We've helped them pay their bills. We've helped them uh, get food. We've helped people in our church family in many different ways. I'm so excited about that, and I've tried in every one of our churches try to lead our churches to be like that. In fact, when I was pastor in First Baptist Church of Christopher, one day one of the uh, leaders of the church came in and said, we were in a meeting. He said, you guys know, I just found out from a friend of mine who works in the county jail that right next to the phone in the county jail is, if you need help, call First Baptist Church of Christopher and the phone number. And at first, he thought that that was a negative. Well, we've got these people just calling us, begging for stuff. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's awesome. <laughs> that is such a cool thing that people know that if they need help, they can call us and somebody will help them. That's the way the Lord wants each of us to be. An encourager sees a need and he meets it. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's not money. Sick people may not need money, but they need a word of concern. Lonely people don't need money, they, they need your time. Hurting people may not need money, but they just need a touch on the shoulder, some, some attention. Discouraged people may not need money, but they just need a sentence of hope. And I know some of you are thinking, and money would really help too, right? <clears throat> Mark Twain once said, I can live two months on one good compliment. Can you think about the last time somebody complimented you and how it boosted you, how it encouraged you? Sometimes that's all somebody needs is a word of encouragement. If you want to be an encourager, when you see a need, meet it. Uh, one of the jobs that I had when I, was, when I was trying to make it, you know, through school and through seminaries, I, I was a manager at UPS. Chris Arps over there, he was a manager at UPS, same hub I was, probably around the same time. And we had a, we had a shift manager, his name was Gene, and, and we would start complaining. I mean, it's a competitive place. You got to move the boxes in and out as fast as you can. And you got different managers that are that are over certain sections of the hub, and the whole hub operates with each other. You know, you, you take the boxes off, you got to sort them, and then they got to be, they gotta be uh, put, put in the trucks, and if one part of this sequence breaks down, then it causes everything to break down. And so it was common for guys to complain about other guys. Uh, but Gene, when he came on to be our manager, he totally broke us of that because we would get on the radio and we'd say, hey, somebody needs to go over there and, and help them with, with, with the loading. They're backing everything up. And then all of a sudden, Gene would get on there and he'd say this, are you a part of the problem or are you a part of the solution, Cowan? And then he'd say, send your, he'd name one of my guys, and it'd always be my best guy. Are you a part of the problem or are you a part of the solution? 
An encourager seeks to be a part of the solution. Think about it. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to spot problems. It's easy to, to be able to identify what's wrong. But God wants us to be a part of the solution, not just somebody who, I can, who can identify the problem. Um, I heard a story about a woman. She was at a light. The light turned green, and she wasn't moving. The car was busted down. She wasn't moving, and the, the man behind him started honking at her. Well, she got out of her car, walked back, knocked on a window. The guy rolled down his window, and she said, pardon me, could you help me? My car won't start. I'll sit here and honk the horn for you while you help me. <laughs> yeah, a part of the problem or a part of the solution. And here's, here is Barnabas seeing needs around and inserting himself, selling, selling a field, taking the money, and saying, here, I want to help out. Uh, bless others. Look for ways to bless others. You got to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, God, man, I'm your child. And you bless me so much. My eyes are open today. Help me to find somebody today that I can bless. Uh, the other day, we were in the drive uh, way, drive through for, for us. Um, I'll get it out, okay? That place called Starbucks. You all know that place, right? Jill and I are in the Starbucks line, and this lady in front of us is like, what is she ordering? It's taking time and time and time. And we waited and we waited and we waited. And I was, I was griping, okay? I was part of the problem, not a part of the solution, you know? I was like, I'm just going to tell that lady when we get up there that, you know, how in the world does it take that long to make one chai, you know? And then we pull up there and she hands us the chai. And I kept my mouth shut. Holy Spirit helped me do that. Kept my mouth shut. And she said, oh, you don't have to pay this. The lady in front of you paid for this. Wow. All right. All right. Right? <laughs> blessing others. It's a joy to be a blessing, isn't it? Not only is the person you bless just filled and encouraged and lifted up, but the act of blessing others, oh, that's powerful, isn't it? Let's go and look on here with, uh, with Barnabas. Secondly, if you want to be an encourager, believe in others. Believe in others. When somebody believes in you, it brings out the best in you. Acts 9, verse 26, look what it says here. And when he, talking about Paul, talking about Saul, he was, he was the persecutor of the church. He gets saved. Now he comes back to Jerusalem, and look what it says. And when he, Saul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Paul had met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. It's been three years since he's been saved. He basically went underground to grow in the Lord and grow in the things of the Lord. Now he's back, and he came to Jerusalem, and he wants to meet the apostles. He wants to meet the disciples. And word got out that Paul, the persecutor, was back, and nobody wanted to have anything to do with him. It said that he attempted to join the disciples, and the word attempted there the Greek verb means repeatedly. It indicates a repeated attempt. But they had put up a barrier, and they would not let him join. They didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in him. You know, everybody shut the door on him. James, the brother of Jesus, didn't want to have anything to do with him. Peter, who had the keys to the kingdom, kept the doors locked. John, the apostle of love, didn't receive him. Nobody received him. But now look at verse 27. But Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas believed in Paul. Look what it says. He reports to them that he preached that he preached the gospel. He's not a persecutor. He's not a killer. I actually, with my own eyes, saw him preaching. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture here. This is my posse in Kenya. And the guy over my right shoulder is a guy named Pastor Siwa. He is absolutely a blast. He's so fun to be around. But one time, he was a criminal. He was a bandit. He was a murderer. And he was hunted by the police in that whole area. And he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ 
turned himself into the prison, to the jailer, and in the jail, he just started preaching to all the criminals, and they started getting saved, one after another after another. Finally, they brought him out, took him to a judge, and the judge said, there's no way that you are the man that they were wanting. You are a different man, and just let him go. That's what happened over there. But Pastor Siwa, after he got saved, he wanted to go get his wife back. And so he goes to his father-in-law's house to bring his wife and take his wife back. And the, and the father-in-law said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're a Christian. I believe you're lying. I don't believe you. I don't think it's true. And Siwa said, it is true. Here, I'll show you. And Siwa said he started walking around that house just preaching. He just preaching out loud to the sky, to the trees, to everything else. Preaching until to the point that the father-in-law said, yes, <laughs> you are saved. I can see that. You are saved. Barnabas testifies, Paul saved. And Barnabas believed in Paul when nobody else did. And that is the mark of a real encourager. An encourager is somebody who's willing to champion the underdog. An encourager is somebody that's willing to jump on the bandwagon when everybody else is jumping off. An encourager is somebody that will walk into your house when the world is walking out. Uh, an encourager is somebody that doesn't bring up the past, but somebody who believes in the future. That's what encouragers do. Encouragers focus on a person's potential, not their past. They focus on potential, not their past. You say, well, how can I be encouraging to people around me that are just rotten? You're coaching them up. You're believing in them in a way that they don't even believe in themselves. You're giving them a chance to be different. And you know what? This is exactly what Jesus did to person after person after person. The woman caught in adultery. Where are your accusers? I'm not going to accuse you either. Go. Don't do it anymore. He did it to Matthew sitting at the, at the tax booth. He just comes to him and says, come follow me. Jesus is always giving somebody the potential to be something different than what they are right now. Do you notice that? Person after person after person. And that's the way the Lord wants us to be, to coach people up, to help, help, help the Holy Spirit be used the Holy Spirit to, dr to drag people up. Looking at people not for their past, not for what they did, not for how they blew it, but taking time to say, you know what, this guy has got potential, this woman, Jesus loves them just as much as Jesus loves me, and I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to give them a chance. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lift them up. And that's what Jesus did. And that's what we are to do. That's what Jesus did with Simon Peter. Remember Simon? Jesus one day said, you are going to be called Peter, which is Petra, which means a rock. And we know that Peter was anything but a rock in those days. His character was not good. Jesus looked at him, though, and said, you are a rock. But in reality, he was Mr. Impulsive. He he was Peter, the foot in the mouth. He is Mr. Embarrassment. He eventually is the one, and Jesus' darkest moment betrayed the Lord Jesus three times. But the Lord looked at him for his potential. He was so, so distraught about his failure that we find him at the end of John on the side of a lake. He went back, not fishing for men, he went back to where he started from, he thought it was a failure, and he went back fishing. And Jesus came to him, met him, and said, Peter, come on, come on, feed my sheep. Three times, for every time that, that Peter denied Jesus, for every time, Jesus looked him in the eye and said, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I love you. Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, yes, Lord, I do. Then get busy. Quit soaking in your past and seize your future. Amen. God does this all the time. And if you're here today and you need that fresh start, I'm here to tell you with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to be defined by your past. You can step forward to a new future. Amen. Here's the, here's the last thing we see encouragers do. Encouragers build up others. Romans chapter 15, verse 2, it says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So we're repeatedly told this in Scripture, to build people up, to encourage one another, to help one another. This is edification. The base word here is build. So Barnabas and Paul were a team. 
And we typically think of Paul first, but at the beginning it wasn't so. It was Barnabas, the son of encouragement, mentoring Paul. Later on, we see it was Barnabas who took Paul to the church at Antioch. Barnabas was sent on a mission from the apostles to encourage the church that was growing in Antioch. And Barnabas said, I'm going to take Saul with me. He can be a big help for me in the church. So he brings Saul with him to the church in Antioch. It's there one night, they're having a prayer meeting, they're ministering to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit said, take Paul, take Barnabas, set them aside, and send them out to be missionaries, to share this gospel all around the Mediterranean. So they do. They send Paul off, they send Barnabas off, and when they get back, they report everything that happened, and then in Acts chapter 15, I'm going to read this, not going to be on the screen, but in Acts chapter 15, Here's what happened next. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Let's go back and let's see them again. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So in the first missionary journey, John Mark goes with Barnabas, goes with Paul. They get to Pamphylia, and Mark, we don't know what happened. Did he get scared? Did he get homesick? I don't know what happened, but he left them. He, he left the group. He, he went back. He, he deserted them. And so now, second trip, John Mark's like, sign me up again. I'll go. And Barnabas and Paul have, a, have an argument about this. In fact, Listen to verse 39. And there arose a sharp disagreement. It was intense. A sharp disagreement. So they separated from each other. Barnabas then took Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. And then Paul chose Silas and took Silas. Now look at this sharp disagreement. Mark, gone on a missionary journey, got discouraged. Now he wants to go back. And Paul says, I don't believe in him anymore. Isn't this ironic that Barnabas believed in Paul, but now Paul's unwilling to believe in Mark? And again, encouragers see potential where other people see problems. And Barnabas was true to his nature to the very end. I'm going to take Mark. Mark's got potential. Mark can be builded. Mark can be encouraged. Mark just needs somebody to believe in him. Charles Schwab, who's a very, very famous businessman, said, I have yet to find a man, however exalted his station, who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than under a spirit of criticism. How true is that? Amen? Years ago, Hollywood put out a movie called Stand and Deliver. Does anybody remember that movie? Stand and Deliver. It was the story of Jamie Escalante. He was an incredibly successful teacher in an extremely rough high school in a rough part of town. And in his class, there were two students named Johnny. One was a bright student, a joy to teach. The other uh, was wasting his talents, bucked authority, refused to learn anything at all. Well, at the very first PTA meeting for parents, Johnny's mother asked Jamie for a report on her son's progress. And Jamie said, why, Johnny is a joy to have in my class. I'm so glad he is one of my students. The next day, this rebellious, rambunctious Johnny walked into the classroom with a big smile on his face, totally different attitude. He ran up to Mr. Escalante and said, my mom told me what you said about me last night, and I just want you to know I've never had a teacher who wanted me before or even liked me. And I'm going to work harder than I've ever done to be a good student. Just believing in somebody, the power of believing in somebody. One encouragement, one encouraging word spoken at the right moment, at the right time for the right person can transform a person's life. It transformed this person's life. And that's exactly what encouragement does. It builds, it builds, it builds. There was a boy whose dad died when he was five years old. This boy dropped out of school after the sixth grade. By the time he was 17, he had lost job after job after job. He married at 18, had a baby at 19, and was separated from his wife uh, uh, at 20. 
He became a railroad conductor, but he got fired. He joined the United States Army, but couldn't stick that out. He became a farmer and lost his farm, lost his shirt over the whole deal. He applied to law school, but he got totally turned down. He became an insurance salesman and couldn't give insurance policies away. Finally, he became a dishwasher and a cook in a restaurant. And one thing he was able to do was to persuade his wife to come back with him together and, and build a life together while he was cooking and washing dishes. At 65 years of age, he retired. He went to his mailbox. He got his first Social Security check that had a grand total of $105. And this 65-year-old man was so discouraged, he decided he was going to commit suicide. He went under a shade tree. He wrote out his last will and testament, determined to end his life. Well, somehow, his wife found out about his scheme and confronted him, and his wife began to encourage him. Let me tell you one thing you can do. I believe better than anybody I've ever known. You can cook. Do you really think so? He said, yes, you can cook. She encouraged him, you can do this better than anybody. So he began to think about that idea. He went down to a local bank, borrowed $87 against his social security check. He went to the supermarket, he bought some chicken and some boxes, he fried it with a special recipe he had developed on his own. He put it in boxes and he began to go door to door around Corbin, Kentucky, selling his chicken. And you know who I'm talking about, right? Colonel Harlan Sanders the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken. The same man that wanted to commit suicide. The same man, 65. They got a new life, got a new start, got a fresh beginning. Listen, be a blessing to others. When you see a need, meet it. Believe in people. Build them. See them for their potential, not for who they are demonstrating themselves to be right now. Coach them up, encourage them up, strengthen them, because that's exactly what the Lord Jesus does for each of us. Amen? Let's bow our heads as we pray. You know, the Bible tells us that to all who receive the Lord Jesus, who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. I don't know where you're at in your life right now spiritually. I don't know what's going on, but I know this. If you open your heart to the Lord, if you open your heart to receive him, the Bible tells us very clearly that you will be a child, a son, a daughter of the Father. It's the absolute most magnificent decision you could ever make in your life. I have never, 30 years of preaching, I have never met somebody who said, I became a Christian and I regret it. I wish I never had. But I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, I wish I had received Jesus into my life sooner. I wish I had done that sooner. Well, today, right now, is a day of salvation, and you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. Lord Jesus, please, come to my life. Be a part of my life. Maybe you're here, and you need a fresh start. You need a beginning. You need the Lord to, to encourage you and strengthen you. You don't want to be defined by your past. You're ready to have a new future. I encourage you, wherever you're at, come forward just a minute as we stand and worship, and let me pray for you. Let me just lay my hands on you and say, Lord Jesus, bless this person. Let your hand be upon them and give them a fresh start. You can come to these, these steps and spend some time praying, seeking the Lord on your own. Uh, you do as the Lord leads you. Let's stand right now as we sing. Lord Jesus, we give you glory. We give you the highest praise. We thank you, Lord, for saving us, covering our sin, giving us a fresh start, Lord Jesus. And may you receive all the glory today and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.